So um, tell me a little bit about, before we go and talk about these other, mm -hmm. these other things, um, tell me a little bit about um, the concepts or the ideas behind genetically modifying mm. your crops so that you can get the traits that you want in them. We had talked earlier uh, about some of the insect resistance traits that yeah. people put into corn, yeah. some of the herbicide resistance traits that people put into soybeans and other things. Um, what, tell me a little bit about your perspective, maybe even your philosophy about genetic modifications and how that can be used for plant breeding in this way. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, in the traditional sense, plant breeding is about crossing this plant that I like with this other plant that I like. And that's what plant breeders have done since the beginning of time. That is good only in so far as I've, the, the genetics that are available to me are going to make useful things. Mm -hmm. Often that's the case, but sometimes I don't have access to genes that would be very, very valuable. And let me give an example. I'm working on um, two diseases, two foliar diseases in beet, and I'm, I'm concerned that there is not going to be resistance in all of beet. Mm -hmm. so, so I can go to a gene bank and I can get you know, beets from all over the world and I can test them, but what if I find none of them have resistance to this disease? Well, this is where more molecular strategies could be extremely valuable. Uh, if one were interested in doing that, one could perhaps access resistance genes from another species. That would require a genetic engineering approach. Now, so far there is no genetically engineered beet. There is genetically engineered sugar beet. Mm. There is no genetically engineered table beet or chard yet. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there ever will be. I don't know if consumers would want that. But the idea there would be accessing a gene. Let's say there's a gene from spinach that would give resistance. Spinach is a close enough relative that I could see a, somebody mm -hmm. excising that gene from spinach and bringing it into uh, table beet, and that would require a kind of genetic modification that would make it a GMO. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Personally, I don't do that work. Um, I'm not. I find that there's enough variability in beet to do many of the things that I want to do, and in fact, there's more variability than I could ever scratch in a, ever look at in, a, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in my whole career. Mm -hmm. But I do understand the idea of accessing genes for which there is no normal genetic variability. Mm -hmm. And so I think that would be the driving force behind that. Yeah. So those are the, the tools that are potentially available. The flip side is, well, I guess if your plant is wonderful in terms of the traits that it has below ground, mm -hmm. but it's very susceptible, that you might have to take some external measures That's to control right. those pathogens or those insects or whatever it is spraying insecticides. That could require and, chemicals. And that's a trade-off too. That is a trade-off. You know, that's something that it's a decision and it has consequences. You, Absolutely. You get the thing you want, but you know, you have to purchase these chemicals. You have to put them in the, into the environment. There's risks to humans, etc. Exactly. And so, you know, as a breeder, I'd like to think that if I made enough crosses and looked at enough progeny, I could find that unique com recombination event. That would be the thing that would have all the traits. And that is exciting. And that's one of the that's one of the thrilling things about being a plant breeder. It's like opening presents all the time. It's like, you know, you make this cross, you don't know exactly what's gonna come out of that cross. And then I come out to the field and I say, Oh, look at what came out of that cross. You know, I'm so excited about it. That is thrilling. But it is all I have to admit that a limitation to it could be that I'm not able to create that fabulous combination. Right? You or know? that it takes 20 years uh, <laughs> right. to come up with that combination. That's right. As well. Classical breed, I call it the slowest of the performing arts <laughs> because it is a, it is a, it does feel like a, an artist. I mean, some this of is this a work is, of art. I have to art. say yeah. it's art and it's, and it's, it's relying on these, these tools of biology to, to do it. It, yeah. it can be a very slow process. Yeah. Um,